Empire. Welcome to Inside the Cap. I'm your host, Joel Corey. You can find me on Twitter at Corey Joel. That's C O R R Y. J-O-E-L, and you can read our regular CBSSports.com column, um, Agents Take on NFL Salary Cap and Contract Matters. This week, we're going to go over potential franchise tag candidates since the 15-day window to designate franchise and transition players opened on February 22nd. The window closes 4 p.m. Eastern Time on March 8th. Um, first, I should probably explain how, what a franchise tag is and how it works. Each league year, every team has the opportunity to restrict one player whose contract is expiring and would be an unrestricted free agent from hitting free agency by sticking a franchise or transition tag on on the player. For franchise tag player, there are two types of tags. There's non-exclusive and exclusive. The non-exclusive allows players to solicit offer sheets from other teams and if an offer sheet is signed and isn't matched by his uh, former team or prior club, then that club gets two first-round picks as compensation. Nobody's moved for full compensation um, since Joey Galloway went from the Seahawks to the Cowboys in 2000, so that's probably not going to happen this year. Um, With the exclusive version, you cannot solicit offer sheets from other teams, and the calculation for the two tags is different. If we're talking the non-exclusive tag, it's it's basically the average of top five salaries uh, for the player's position in the previous year, but it's a little more complicated than that. Um, what's done is something's created called the cap percentage average, and by that, you take the five largest salaries from the uh, previous year, and you take the sum of that, you take the sum of the salary caps for the previous five years, divide them into each, into each other, multiply them by the upcoming, um, that percentage you get by the upcoming salary cap, and that's going to be uh, what your tag number is. So the more the cap goes up, the bigger the uh, tag numbers are going to be. Last year, since the cap dropped from 1982 million to 182.5 million then you saw a drop in franchise tag numbers they're going to bounce back in a big way now it's either that or 120 percent of a prior year of the players prior of the players prior year salary and by salary it's essentially um salary cap number minus a, a couple of uh work uh minus workout bonuses and other uh, and other um performance bonuses now, for the exclusive tag, it's the average of top five salaries at a player's position when the restricted free agent signing period ends this upcoming April. Um, normally, exclusive tags are reserved for quarterbacks. So that's basically how they work. And that 120% of prior year salary provision uh, applies there. It's, it's, it's just a recap. It's the formula provision or 120% of prior year salary, whichever is greater. Now, let's go briefly run down what the projected tag numbers are going to be. The salary cap for the 2022 league year is supposed to be $208.2 million. So for cornerback, that's supposed to be, I got it at $17.287 million. Defensive end, $17.85 million. Defensive tackle, $17.396 million. Linebacker. 18.702 million offensive line 16.662 million when I say offensive line they don't differentiate between center guard and tackle so it's the same tag number regardless of which position you play and for linebacker it doesn't distinguish between off ball linebackers and edge rushers for some reason edge rushers aren't their own separate category so 3 4 outside linebackers are treated differently than 4 3 defensive ends even though they're essentially the same thing in terms of if you take a 3-4 outside linebacker and you turn it to a 4-3, 4-3 defense, in almost, most, on almost all cases, it becomes a defensive end. Now, kicker, punter, same number together, $5.22 million. Quarterback, uh, $29.703 million. Running back, 
9.57 million. Safety, 12.911 million. Tight end, 10.31 million. And wide receiver, 18.419 million based off the formula. Uh, so let's uh, go through these team by team. Buffalo Bills, we'll start the AFC East. The Buffalo Bills, nobody really that you would consider a serious tag candidate. Now, Miami, the most logical tag candidate would be Mike uh, Giusecki, the tight end. At least that's his listed position. He had 73 catches, 780 yards, and two touchdowns. The potential problem with uh, putting a tag on him is the way they play him. Um, he might be considered wide receiver. And how and how, how it works is NFL Management Council decides the position. Uh, they'll most likely call him a tight end if the Miami Dolphins stick a tag on him. And then it would be up to uh, Gusecki or his agent to file a grievance to get him reclassified as a wide receiver. And the reason that you would want to be a wide receiver, you'd have to win the grievance, which Jimmy Graham couldn't do in 2012, is... It's a totally different calculation. I mean, I mean, calculus, I should say. And dynamic if you're talking wide receiver number versus um, tight end number. There's a 7.488 million difference. Almost 7.5 million difference in the two tag numbers. Uh, there's an article that I encourage you guys to read if you're curious about why he should be a wide receiver and not a tight end. Um, for these purposes on Pro Football Focus that was published on the 21st by Ian Hartitz. So um, he goes through why he should be a wide receiver based on where he's lined up, um, whether he's who he's blocking, who's covering him. So um, I would check that out um, if I were you, if you're interested. Now, with those type of stats last year, the low-hanging fruit for all tight ends is going to be the Jonu Smith deal in particular. The Patriots paid two tight ends, Jonu Smith and Hunter Henry, $12.5 million per year in free agency last year. Jonu Smith in particular wasn't all that productive. 28 catches, 294 yards, and one touchdown. Gusecki's going to want more than $12.5 million per year. I can guarantee you that <laughs> um, in, in free agency. There's no, <laughs> there's no way around that if he hits the open market or if he doesn't hit the open market and it's a closed negotiation with the um, tag but if he wants a grievance then he's probably going to play under the one-year tag for almost 18 and a half million highest paid tight end is George Kittle at 15 million per year it would give him the ammunition if they wanted to keep him long term to replace Kittle as the highest paid tight end let's go to New England Patriots um their most logical candidate uh would be J.C. Jackson and J.C. Jackson there's some question marks about him going into the year is he going to be able to assume number one uh, cornerback duties while Stephon Gilmore is out um, rehabbing his quad injury? And then it became, well, Gilmore's now traded to the Carolina Panthers. Um, is he going to be able to continue that for a full season? Yeah, he passed that test with flying colors. Since 2018, he's got the most interceptions. Since 2019, I should say, he's got the most interceptions in the NFL of 22. He was second in the league this year with eight. He had a league-leading 23 passes defensed, was named to his first Pro Bowl, and was November's AFC Defensive Player of the Month. So, uh, New England may pass on the tag because they're not flush with cap room like they were last year when they went on their huge spending spree. But um, another reason why they might is they've had pretty good success in finding cornerbacks. They didn't um, tag Malcolm Buck Butler, who was an undrafted free agent, just like J.C. Jackson was an undrafted free agent. So they might feel that they can find a corner to replace him if he's going to be too cost prohibitive. And I don't see any universe where you're going to sign J.C. Jackson uh, for less than what Byron Jones got at the open mount market in 2020 free agency where he briefly became the highest-paid cornerback in the league with a five-year, $82.5 million contract, averaging $16.5 million per year. That deal had $54.375 million of guarantees, where $40 million was fully guaranteed at signing. That would be a disappointing deal, in my opinion, for J.C. Jackson. Really, I expect him to be bordering the $20 million per year club. You have 
um, cornerbacks, Jalen Ramsey, only $20 million per year defensive back. You got Marlon Humphrey at $19.5 million per year. Marshawn Lattimore at nineteen point four. Personally, I'd be asking my asking price in free agency if I get to the open market would be to become the highest paid cornerback. Um, the Jets don't have a uh, candidate. They franchised Marcus May in 2021, the safety. Then he tore his Achilles midway during the year. And he wasn't performing up to the same level as he did in 2021 at that point. This episode is brought to you by DirecTV Stream. Introducing DirecTV Stream, the best of live TV and on demand, which means you can get all your favorite sports, movies, and shows together. So you can watch new episodes of your favorite reality shows live or binge old episodes on demand. Either way, get ready for some drama. And the best part? DirecTV Stream has no annual contract. DirecTV Stream. Get your TV together at directtv.com. Requires high-speed internet and compatible device. Content varies by package and location. Restrictions apply. Moving to the AFC North. Um, there's nobody for the Ravens. The most logical candidate for the Bengals is going to be Jesse Bates. That always seemed destined to be a franchise tag situation when he couldn't get a deal done with the Bengals last offseason. And he he wanted to get a deal done, wants to stay there, expressed some frustration about the lack of progress on a new contract during the preseason, and then admitted that it was affecting his play early in the regular season. He earned um, second-team All-Pro honors in 2020 and didn't start playing up to that level again until the playoffs. Now, the Bengals would have been smart, smarter, I should say, to get something done be, uh, during the offseason or before the middle of the preseason. You, at the time, you had uh, Justin Simmons as the highest paid uh, safety at um, 15.25 million per year. Um, he signed a four-year, $61 million contract as a franchise player. Then you had the market reset with Jamal Adams getting $70 million over four years worth up to $72 million with incentives and salary escalators from the Seahawks. And you had an older safety Harrison Smith come in, signed for $16 million per year to stay put with the uh, Vikings on an extension, and he's 32. So you're going to be north, I would think, of Justin Simmons if you're doing um, any type of extension with uh, Jesse Bates. Now, um, let's move to the uh, Cleveland Browns. Now, on the surface, the Browns don't have anyone that you would think would be a franchise tag candidate. But I think David Njoku, uh, former 2017 first-round pick, is a franchise tag candidate for the Browns. Although his statistical contributions wouldn't suggest so. But he compares favorably statistically to Jonu Smith in his contract year. Jonu Smith, 41 catches, 448 yards, 8 touchdowns. In a run-heavy offense, just like the Titans, but also having to contend with another high-priced tight end, Austin Hooper, who makes $10.5 million per year. Um, Mjoku, 36 catches, 475 yards, 4 touchdowns. So I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up getting a franchise tag. And there was a report from Mary Kay Cabot that the Browns have been having conversations with David Joku's agents for months. And they're prepared to pay him double-digit millions that he would get, that they think he would get on the open market. And if he got that, it would go into the whole... You expect the contribution to go up. He's got that first-round pick pedigree, and he's extremely athletic. The Jacksonville Jaguars um, put a tag on Cam Robinson last year um, for $13.754 million. Um, They've got Walker Little potentially waiting in the wings, the 2021 second-round pick. I would say that Robinson's a competent tackle, and, and this is all... Potentially, potentially him getting a second franchise tag would be because he plays an extremely valuable position where where there's a premium placed on him. 
And he'd be the rare instance where the 120% provision wouldn't come into effect because it's less than what's being spit out by the formula. He only gave up one sack in 2021, 31 total quarterback pressures. But I wouldn't stick a second tag on him. I'd try to upgrade if I could at the position. And one guy I would set my sights on since the Jaguars have a ton of cap room would be uh, Teron Armstead from the Saints since the Saints can't stick a franchise tag on him because of the way the voiding of his contract works. It doesn't. It's a contract year for these purposes until it actually voids. The voiding date is the last day of the league year, um, which is eight days after the designation period to be a franchise player. So that would be out of the question. If I had to pay him, put Armstead in the $20 million per year um, left tackle club, and even make him the highest paid left tackle in the league, it's slightly over $23 million per year. I'd do it, even though the durability concerns with him, because he'd be a huge upgrade. I'd rather do that, pay him at 31, than pay Cam Robinson 17, 18 million dollars per year. That's just me. Now, Tennessee Titans have one candidate in Harold Landry. Now, the big problem with Harold Landry is that he wants to be the highest paid defensive player on the team. You went out and paid another edge rusher last year, Bud Dupree, <laughs> and Harold Landry had 12 sacks this year. Uh, Bud du- and he did what you were expecting Bud Dupree to do. <laughs> so he, I can't see a circumstance where he's going to take less than $16.5 million per year to be a Titan, um, which is worth up to $17 million um, with incentives. Dupree got that coming off of a torn ACL. Tore his ACL December 2020 playing for the Steelers. Now, if you let Harold Lander hit the open market, I expect the Atlanta Falcons to put a full court, pre- full court press on him. And the reason I say that is one thing I learned as an agent is that familiarity brings comfort. And in a lot of cases, you see coaches who had a positive experience with a player. When they go elsewhere, those teams pursue them in free agency. Dean Pease, who was... The Titans coach is the Atlanta Falcons defensive coordinator, and they need a pass rush in the worst way after cutting Dante Fowler Jr. a couple of weeks ago. Now on to the AFC West. Um, They don't really have a candidate um, in Denver. Uh, Cortland Sullivan uh, Sutton, who would have been a potential franchise tag candidate, signed extension in the middle of the season for $15 million per year. Now, if the Kansas City Chiefs, um, they got two... Uh, important guys with expiring contracts. Teron Matthew will not get a franchise tag. It'll be $23.63 million. The way the 120% increase salary increase provisions work, but he was never going to get it regardless because of Orlando Brown. The um, After giving up significant draft capital to get Orlando Brown, there is no way that the um, Kansas City Chiefs weren't going to stick a franchise tag on him in his switch from right tackle to left tackle. You gave up uh, the 31st overall pick in the 2021 draft, a third-round pick in 2021, and a fourth-round pick in 2021 to get Brown, and a 2022 fifth-round pick to get Brown, a 2021 second-round pick, and a 2022 sixth-round pick. So you didn't really move on from Eric Fisher to have him be a one-year rental. He's definitely going to be in the $20 million per year offensive lineman club, which um, right now only has three members, Trent Williams, David Bakhtiari, Laramie, and Laramie Tunsil at $23.01 million, $23 million, and $22 million per year, respectively. He's a better Brown is a better right tackle than left tackle, but in my opinion, he wants to be a left tackle, which is why he left Baltimore, and a deal which will be very important to him is topping – um, what Ronnie Stanley got um, when he signed. And Ronnie Stanley, when he signed, I thought he was going to join the $20 million per year club, but he came in at, at a shade under that when he did an extension with the Ravens. So he's going to get a franchise tag from Kansas City um, in all likelihood. Um, the Las Vegas Raiders don't have a candidate. And the Los Angeles Chargers um, have one candidate, which is interesting because they have a ton of cap room. They'll They'll have upwards of $55 million in cap space. It's just a question of whether they want to stick a franchise tag 
on Mike Williams. They were comfortable with his fifth-year option at 15.68 million, so the 120 uh, percent provisions would apply to Mike Williams. So it's going to be 18.816 million to stick a franchise tag on. Mike Williams, he had a career year in 2021, 76 catches, 1,146 receiving yards, and nine touchdowns. Um, Justin Herbert uh, wants him back. Um, This is the opportunity where if you could rent him for another year, if you don't sign a long-term deal, where Herbert is as cheap as possible. You can't do a contract extension with Herbert until the 2022 regular season ends. Um, If I'm Mike Williams, I'm looking to go north of Kenny Galladay. Kenny Galladay, off of an injury plague 2020 season, left the Detroit Lions to go to the New York Giants in free agency and got $18 million per year, $72 million over four years. Deal maxes at $76 million with $40 million overall guarantees and $28 million fully guaranteed at signing. Okay, now let's move to the NFC, starting with the NFC East. Um, for the Dallas Cowboys, some people have suggested that Randy Gregory, um, the defensive end, could be a franchise tag candidate, but the tag number significantly exceeds what would be his market value. So in those situations, you typically don't stick a tag on someone. So the most logical candidate would be Dalton Schultz, the uh, The Cowboys have to shed cap room in order to be compliant. So I really don't think Dalton Schultz gets a tag, but the tag number is probably going to be less than what he would be asking in free agency. And even if you did two tags for him, the average of two tags is twenty-four million, a little over twenty-four million. That's basis. I mean, the total is twenty-four million. That's a little over twelve million per year. He's going to be asking for more than that, just like Gasecki. Dalton Schultz is going to be asking for more than twelve and a half million per year. Now, Dalton Schultz was supposed to be the blocking tight end, and his blocking is better than some Cowboys fans like to think. But uh, Jake uh, Blake Jarwin's. Um, torn ACL in the beginning of the 2020 season opened the door for Dalton Schultz and he never gave that job back he now has had two productive years in a row as tight end as a tight end this year became the only tight end besides Jason Witten to have over 70 receptions he had 78 receptions 808 receiving yards and 8 touchdown catches that's more than John U. Smith has done in the past two years in 31 games. John U. Smith, 69 catches, 742 yards, 9 TDs in 31 games over the past two years. So, you see why John U. see why Dalton Schultz is going to be asking for more than John U. Smith's 12.5 million per year. Okay, let's move on to the New York Giants. They really don't have anybody you stick a tag on. I don't see any reason why they would ever stick a tag on Evan Ingram, who to me got to the Pro Bowl in 2020 because of injuries at the tight end position. Zach Ertz, who had been going for the past couple of years, and George Kittle um, were injured. He had 46 catches, 408 yards, and three touchdowns. So (laughs) he's a first-round pick in 2017 like Njoku, but that's not someone <laughs> I'd be sticking a franchise tag on. Let's keep it moving in the division. The Philadelphia Eagles did extensions for anyone that would potentially be a franchise tag candidate. That includes Jordan Mulata, the offensive tackle, and Dallas Goddard, um, tight end. Um, Mulata would have been the more intriguing um, candidate because him signing at $16 million per year, um, given that he's barely played football in his life, was making the transition from rugby. Someone, if you had let him hit the open market, he was going over $20 million per year. <laughs> but they don't have to worry about that because they were proactive. And let's go to the Washington Commanders. Uh, Brandon Sheriff's not going to get another franchise tag. He's been tagged the past two years, made $18.036 million on the second tag. The two tags have averaged about $16.5 million per year. Um, the third tag would be at the quarterback number. No one, they're not going to stick a third tag because of the way the rules work. It's 144% of your prior year salary or the biggest 
number at any position where there's a tag, which is quarterback, the Washington Commanders are going to let him at the open market. Now, um, what we've seen in the past few years is that any time um, you have a high-profile Pro Bowl caliber guard who hits the open market in free agency, normally he becomes the highest-paid player at the position. This happened with Andrew Norwell, Coleccio Simile, Joe Tooney this past year, who's tied at the highest-paid guard by average per year with Joel Batonio at $16 million per year, and Kevin Zeitler. So despite the durability concerns where he misses time for injuries each year, he's going to want to be the highest-paid guard. If he gets it, it'll be short-lived because the Colts, Quentin Nelson, if I'm Quentin Nelson, I want to be the first $20 million per year interior offensive lineman. Okay, so that wraps up the NFC East. Let's go to the NFC North. Let's go to Chicago Bears. Um, Allen Robinson was someone who was given a franchise tag in 2020. I don't see that happening again in 2021. The second franchise tag would be $21.556 million. Um, he was not on the same page with uh, Justin Fields. Had his worst year statistically when he's been healthy um, in his career. So that's out of the question. It'll be interesting to see how he is in free agency. Because going into the 2021 season, he'd been one of the most productive receivers in the NFL with the previous two years of 200 receptions, nearly 2,400 receiving yards. Um, We'll see if he gets the benefit of the doubt. Um, He was probably looking for over $20 million per year when the Bears and Robinson's camp were last last negotiating, which my understanding was early in the 2020 season. That might be a very high bar to clear, given the lack of productivity this year. But um, he's going to be on the open market. Detroit Lions don't have anyone who is worth franchising. Uh, neither, neither do the Minnesota Vikings, so that leaves the Green Bay Packers. And I know Brian Gutekas said that a franchise tag is a last resort for Devontae Adams. To me, you got to stick a franchise tag on Devontae Adams regardless of what you do with um, Aaron Rodgers, what he decides to do, stay or go. Devontae Adams has been the most productive receiver in football over the past, I don't know if you can go back five years, go back three years, he's it. So I really don't see him hitting the open market and the Packers in a worst-case scenario only getting a compensatory third-round pick for Devontae Adams. Um, He wants to be the highest-paid wide receiver. Um, And then there are reports he wants $30 million per year. That's very aggressive and ambitious. Highest-paid wide receiver by new money and and contracts negotiated over new money. is The new money is what the negotiation is about. Is the is DeAndre Hopkins two year extension with the Cardinals right before the 2020 regular season started at 27.5 million per year. If Aaron Rodgers goes elsewhere, then maybe it's a tag and trade scenario where you're trying to recoup as much compensation for Devontae Adams, and it'll be a whole lot more than that compensatory third round pick you get in 2023. Um, Stephon Diggs was the last uh, wide receiver trade, and that was a first-round pick plus. So it'd be like a something like a first-round pick and a third-round pick, and maybe another pick or a first-round pick, a fourth-round pick, and something. But you should be able to at least get a first-round pick back for Devontae Adams um, if you decide to go the tag and trade route. Um, if Aaron Rodgers is there, uh, then that gives Devontae Adams a ton of leverage with the Packers because the only reason Aaron Rodgers is recommitting to the Packers is for his favorite receiver to be there for as long as he's there and not just a one-year rental. Um, Let's go to the NFC South. Um, The Atlanta Falcons uh, don't really have anyone to franchise tag, although uh, Cordero Patterson played well last year, was a pleasant surprise. Nobody thought he would be the Falcons' most indispensable offensive weapon is a running back slash wide receiver. Um, He was named Pro Football Writers of America's co-most improved uh, player with uh, Trayvon Diggs, the Cowboys cornerback. But you're not going to stick a franchise tag for $9.45 million 
on, or I should say 9.57 million, I should say, on um, Patterson. So I think he stays put because this has been, he had a career year, but not at those numbers. Um, franchise tag number should be too high for Hassan Reddick, who had 11 sacks and proved that 2020 wasn't a fluke in terms of him getting to the quarterback. But the number, whether it's the outside linebacker, I mean the linebacker number or the defensive end number, and he's listed as a linebacker by position, 17, 18, 19 million is more than he'll sign on a long-term deal. So he would be the most logical candidate, but still no. The Saints last year had to shed over 110 million in payroll just to be um, in cap commitments, to just to be compliant. This year it's only about 75, and they've started. Um, with um, restructures of people like um, Michael Thomas, which means he's not getting traded, and Ron Ramsick, the right tackle. So, second franchise tag is a possibility for Marcus Williams. He's going to want over $16 million per year. Um, he was smart to not get a deal done last year because he knew Jamal Adams was going to redefine safety pay. So, he's someone that will reap the benefit of that. And if you want a long-term deal with him from that great 2017 draft class the Saints have, that's where the market's going to be. Um, I would think north of $16 million on a long-term deal for Marcus Williams. Now, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are not bringing the <laughs> band back together this year because Tom Brady announced his retirement. Ali Marpet did today as well. I don't think free agents are going to take less money to come back because you're not trying to win a championship again. Uh, You're not the defending champions anymore. But um, Chris Godwin probably would have gotten a second franchise tag or it would have been something that they thought very hard about giving him if he hadn't torn his ACL late in the season. Tore his ACL and his right ACL and MCL. Um, in early December. So that's kind of out of the question. Um, I don't think the knee injury is going to dramatically affect the overall dollars he gets on free agency or to stay put maybe structurally. The guarantees change, but I'm still looking to go $20 million per year if I'm Godwin. And given the timing of his injury, he might be back for the start of the regular season. He's 25 years old or 20, will be 26. He's right around the same age. Cooper Cup was when he tore his ACL and right around the same timing when the Rams went to the Super Bowl um, and lost to the Patriots. He didn't miss a regular season game. Obviously, there are no ill effects from Cooper Cup's uh, injury because he had a season for the ages this year winning the NFL Triple Crown for receiving. So um, if Godwin's out of the question, that leaves Carlton Davis because corners are rare commodities, although He was injured for a good part of the 2021 season. Um, I think that a 25-year-old cornerback who has very good coverage skills is the type of guy you stick a franchise tag on uh, normally. And let's go to the NFC West. Now, the Arizona Cardinals have two older free agents. Neither one of them is franchise tag worthy. Um, Chandler Jones, their edge rusher, they say they want back who they say that they want to have him back. Because of the way the 120% provisions work, um, you're not sticking a franchise tag on him. It would be $25 million. And same thing for Zach Ertz. It would be the 120% provisions, even though he was a trade, because it still goes off of his full cap number, not just the Cardinals portion. So you're talking over $15 million for Zach Ertz. Um, Zach Ertz was essentially the most productive tight end the Cardinals have ever had in 11 games. He proved at the injury in 2020, the ankle injury, that he probably shouldn't have played through because he had off-season surgery and wasn't cleared until right before the start of training camp. He probably never should have played on that. But he had 56 catches, 574 receiving yards in 11 games with the um, Cardinals. So if a 31-year-old Jimmy Graham can get $10 million per year and the cap's gone up, uh, maybe 20% since then, then he should be well north of $11 million. If I'm Zach Ertz, despite him being 31, that John U. Smith deal something I want to leapfrog above as well. 
let's go to the uh, Los Angeles Rams. Well, they don't really have a realistic candidate because Von Miller, same thing with um, Zach Ertz. The trade doesn't lessen the, the franchise tag number. It's still the 120% provision for him as well. So it would be 26.45 million. Not going to happen. Plus, he's a pass rusher in his early 30s. And at some point, you hit diminishing returns with those guys. So that's not going to happen. Darius Williams was the only restricted free agent in 2021 to get a first round tender. But he's going to hit the open market because there's no way you're sticking a franchise tag on him when you already have uh, Jalen Ramsey making $20 million per year. Williams' height at 5'9 might be a limitation for some people um, in terms of wanting him as a, a, a cornerback, but I see him in that Adoree Jackson range. Um, and Adoree Jackson was someone that once his um, fifth-year option wasn't he was released from the fifth year option in 2017 draft class was the last draft class where the option didn't become fully guaranteed upon exercise. So, so they were able to do that. Or Dory Jackson, 39 million over three years worth up to 44.5 million in free agency with 26 and a half million dollars in guarantees. So I see that $13 million per year neighborhood or a little bit more as the range for Darius Williams. Um, San Francisco 49ers don't have anyone worth franchising after getting um, a deal done with Fred Warner, which briefly made him the highest paid off-ball linebacker at $19 million per year before Darius Leonard uh, topped him um, a couple of weeks later. Now, the Seattle Seahawks have only one guy who potentially could be a franchise tag candidate, and that's uh, Quandre Diggs. He made the Pro Bowl. Um, one or two Pro Bowl players that the Seahawks have, other one being Bobby Wagner. The only problem is, well, the two problems, he broke his leg late in the season. He's going to be healthy and fine, so that shouldn't really factor in the equation. But you're paying Jamal Adams $17.5 million per year. So how much money do you want to invest in the safety pres- in the safety position? So I would think that he's looking at that 11 point. $5 million per year range in a worst case scenario that John Johnson got to leave the Rams for the uh, Cleveland Browns. So I envision him uh, moving on elsewhere, even though I read something about how the Seahawks are having negotiations with him. Now, um, one thing I neglected to mention, and this will go back to, it's going to apply more to Devontae Adams than anybody else, which is how you calculate the 120%. Of, of salary provisions. The way that works is you take the player's base salary, you take the prorated portion of the signing bonus, any per game roster bonuses, then you multiply that by 120%. And in Adam's case, that means we are talking 16.35 million. You multiply that by 120%. That gets you to 19.62 million. That's not just all. He had $500,000 workout bonus. You add that back in after the fact. You would add back in any incentives after the fact as well. So then it's another 500. So it's going to be 20.12 million. What you don't do is you don't take that $500,000 uh, workout bonus, add it in first, then go 120%, which is going to get you to 20.22 million. That's how that how that works. So you're not going off of 16.85 times 120 percent. That's not how you do it. You take that workout bonus, you add that back in after the fact. So you get 20.12 million for what would be Devonte Adams franchise tag. Now that's going to be it for this week's Inside the Cap. Um, thanks for listening. Don't forget you can find me on Twitter at Corey Joel, that's C-O-R-R-Y-J-O-E-L, and also read my work at CBSSports.com. Um, thank you, and goodbye.